Good noon, everybody. <laughs> I was trying to type in, well, it's not an afternoon Bible study. Well, Bible study is good noon time. Yep. Oh, goodness. There we are. <coughs> Hope everybody had a good New Year's Eve and a good New Year's Day. And a good Christmas. We haven't been on in a while. Yep. So this is the first one of this new year. Yes, it is. And a new study to start. So let's get all of our shares going. Try to get everybody's to see we're online and here again. Just about then. Well, we're really excited. Um, we opted not to go live until the new year because we were busy. So many things were happening, and um, we wanted to start a new series. And we thought new year, new series, so kind of fitting. Um, and so we're really excited. We're going to be starting a, a, a study called Coins, Covenants, and Character. And um, if you've watched us at all, you know we love um, Rhonda Holland, and this is another one of her Bible studies. Um, so if you are looking for good Bible studies um, for the new year, I suggest um, looking up Pathway, looking up Rhonda Holland. She's got several good Bible studies, and I think she's got a new one coming out this month. I'm excited. I'm oh, that'll definitely be beginning it. <laughs> yep. So, but... Um, I actually think it's amazing we're going to be doing this Bible study, and, and it's based off of three scriptures. Um, it's a parable of, of Jesus, and, um, you know, I, I love um, reading Jesus' parables and um, just how he would make people think um, by telling his stories, um, and this was one of those. You know? Well, I mean, it's always wonderful that wherever Jesus went, you know, if he was at a seaside community, he would tell about fishing. If he was in a farming community, he would adjust the story so that it would be like the sower. Yes. And it's always, you know, he hit the people where they lived. Exactly. And, you know, that was the great thing about his teaching. He made it rel uh, relatable to everybody. Yes. He knew exactly how to get to where you are. And the thing about it is, is um, the Bible, and there's even a verse that says the Bible is, um, sharper than a two-edged sword and the thing is is it can it can hit you right where you're at mm -hmm. uh, no matter what your situation no matter uh, what station you are in life or, or where you are the Bible has the ability to reach everybody and um, anyway so that's kind of cool well that's that's why even Jesus came he came to the lowest all the way up to the highest yes and it's harder for a king to come to Christ than it is for a poor person. Yeah. I mean, we know that for a fact. And it's just amazing that the king of, you know, of everything came down to us who are lowest of the low sometimes. Yes. And that's where we started out. And he's brought us, he's brought us to him because we couldn't go on our own. Yeah. So we're going to start out reading the first two scriptures um, of our new text, and it's found in Luke chapter 15. Um, it's going to be verses 8 through 10, but right now we're just going to read verses 8 and 9. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. So now we're gonna we're gonna give a little history about um, Jewish women, and this was something I didn't know until I read this Bible study. Um, when a Jewish woman was chosen to become a bride, her father gave her a bridal headpiece consisting of ten coins. She didn't earn the coins; they were a symbolic gift. When she accepted this headpiece, she was making an oath that she would walk in covenant with the bridegroom and his family. The coins were worn in the same way we may wear an engagement ring or a wedding band today. A creditor could not 
ever take the coins away from her, even if she owed him money and she couldn't pay. All who saw them respected them as representation of her covenant. If she removed one and used it for purchases, it was considered disrespectful to her husband, and she wasn't allowed to do this without his permission. If she willy, willfully walked out of her covenant with her husband, he may actually remove a coin as a symbol of her unfaithfulness for all to see. Um, I feel like sometimes we have so much stuff um, in our in our life in our house that we don't value things like this woman had value for this coin. Well, even in the nation we live in, the marital relationship has lost a lot of its value. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of people who don't even see the point in getting married. Yep. And you know, as someone who's been married for 15 years, almost 16 now. I have a lot of value in the relationship that we have and in the commitment that we make. Yes. You know, it's something we can actually not only know that's there and count on, really, because yes. I've been over the road. I've been the long way from home many times for a long time. And it's uh, I never had to worry about it. Yes. But the, the point that Jesus was making here was he was talking really about the value of people. Mm -hmm. um, that people are valuable to him and that one lost soul matters to him. I mean, this would be a perfect place for the theme song, Reckless Love, um, to leave the hundred to find the one, leave the 99 to find the one. There we go. Yeah, and you know, one of the big things that hits me, it doesn't say she has no other money. Yeah. It doesn't say she has no other silver coins. It's just these particular 10, and she loses one. Yes. You know, just like you were saying, there's 99 sheep and Jesus still goes after the one. Yes. And that's exactly. the big part of it. You know, we have to realize that every individual person matters. But and the and the thing about it is is the whole point is because she, just because she's looking for the one doesn't mean she's forgotten the other nine. It just there's an importance and an urgency in finding the one that is missing, mm -hmm. the one that is lost. And, you know, you know, when Jesus in the song, so, you know, leaves the 99, he's not technically leaving the 99. They're not out there, you know, wondering themselves without Jesus. But it's the fact that he loves you so much that he's willing to do anything to go after you. Well, I like that it's, you know, it's not any particular one. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been the first coin, it could have been the last coin, it could have been the first sheep they ever had, it could have been the last one, it could have been somewhere in the middle. Yes. The fact was that one of them's missing. Yes, exactly. These coins were valued much more than their actual worth because they represented her covenant and her faithfulness to that covenant. I have often thought of this passage of scripture and the excitement that finding the lost coin created. This woman, when she recovered what she had lost, called her friends and neighbors together to celebrate. We know from historical accounts that when the Jewish people celebrated with family and friends, often there was a great feast and party atmosphere to enhance the rejoicing. Obviously, the celebration alone would cost more than the worth of the coin. That thought further enhances the probability that the value of the coin was based on what it represented rather than its actual worth. Jesus was a powerful teacher and illustrated his points in ways that were clearly understood to those who really listened. Mm -hmm. I imagine when he spoke these powerful parables in Luke 15, he spoke to those present with illustrations that applied to their everyday lives, which is sort of what Gary was mm -hmm. saying at the beginning. This chapter begins by telling us that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. What a group! had gathered around Jesus. This is not the typical group that you would think would be around Jesus. You, well, you would think he would be in the midst of, of Bible scholars and, and you know priests and, and people of that nature. Well, what's really cool is this is the one. I mean, these are the ones. You know, it's not the 99 he's preaching to. These are the ones. These are the exactly. ones he came to. You know, and just like he says later, you know, you don't send a doctor to the well, you send them to the sick. 
That's right. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go out and we're supposed to go into the community, into the places where the ones that are sick are, are sinners. Yes. Because a lot of them don't know another way to live. A lot of them don't know the promises that we have. And we have to realize that we're here to teach and we're here to, well, it's really called preaching because preaching isn't for those who are already saved. It's actually for those who are sinners. Right now, when we go to church, we're being edified. Yes. You know, we're supposed to go out and we're supposed to preach and we're supposed to teach those who are, you know, ignorant of what's really going on in this world. Well, I mean, I've always liked um, the thought, you know, that we are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt in the salt mm -hmm. shaker? It's not any good. And really, the church represents, you know, when we come into the building, that's the salt shaker. We can all be seen, but we're not doing any good in our community just sitting in the pews of our church. But it's important that we come to church to keep our saltiness, to keep being mm -hmm. fed, to keep, you know, up on you know what god wants to speak into our life so then when we disperse and we go out into our communities into our jobs into our homes and with our families that we are we still have that flavor that we're still holding off the decay and that we're still um winning souls and 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 bringing our families and friends and co-workers into the, the light of his truth yeah and one of the things that always sticks with me is the story about the fire and the coal you know, if you bring a piece of coal or a piece of ember out from the fire and let it sit there, it'll stay hot for a little while, but then yes. it'll go out. Yes. But if you put that ember back into the fire, it'll reignite. And that's what we are. You know, if we don't yes. come to the church, if we don't come and embrace one another, you know, right now with all the stuff going on, embrace might be a quotative <laughs> term, but... We need to come and we need to uplift each yes. other. Not only, you know, verbally and seeing each other, but we need to do it behind closed doors in prayer. Well, in the Bible specifically says, forsake not mm -hmm. the assembling of yourselves together. Um, you know, there's, there's things that happen in the spiritual realm when God's people are in unity and one accord in a, in a church service and in that kind of a, a thing. And I think that's one of the things that's important here is, you know, she's gone through this vigorous um, looking for the lost coin, and when she loses that coin, and finds that coin, then she calls everybody together. And, you know, that's what we do at the church. We, When we come together as the body of Christ, we are to mourn with one another. You know, if we've lost somebody, we mourn people mm -hmm. together. When something good happens, we celebrate with one another. I think that's why there's so many church dinners. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's a good thing. It's what God, you know, wants us to do. You know, one of the things that really gets me is the other day, I don't know if y'all ever worked with around dirt or I was looking. I don't like dirt. Well, I don't either, but <laughs> it, I was cleaning out the shop and I was trying to organize my tools and I was taking my tools out of this one bag that I've had for 15 years or more and I was looking in it to get all the little washers out well I had you know swept across it looked in through it I couldn't find you know I thought I had gotten them all well I grabbed a magnet off the shelf and I went over it and of course washers and other things that had settled under the dirt started to come to the surface. And that's one of those things when it says she swept the house. Back then they had dirt floors. Yes. Then yes. things could lay on the floor and get covered up by dirt. And you know, yes. we were talking about relationships. If you don't go in and you don't clean out yourself concerning that relationship, things can hide in there. Yes. And then, rip, you know, one of the things that Crystal and I did before we got married is we told each other everything. You know, we went the dirt. <laughs> yeah. And we basically swept house. We cleaned the house out because we wanted to start our life together knowing everything. It didn't change anything because it was under the blood. Yes. And that's one thing we really have to understand is that, you know, God comes in, he sweeps out the house, the Holy Spirit cleans it up. And then we need to continually daily clean it up in our house we have tile everywhere in, in west texas yeah and getting the kids <laughs> to sweep the house or keep it clean 
is like trying to tell a dog not to eat their food. Yes. And it's insane. And so we bought this new broom and that excited them for a little bit because it was They're over a, it already. Yeah, it's already done. <laughs> and so now we're I ha, I'm pushing it around. I still like it because it cleans it up faster than you having to sweep it into a dustpan. But it's amazing how much dirt will cover up the things that you're trying to find. Yes. The powerful parables Jesus shared in Luke 15 teach about God's love for the lost and his desire to compel them to come home. Uh, the chapter also serves to remind the self-righteous Pharisees of God's grace, restoration, and forgiveness extended to the sinner. This passage delivered a message of compa compassion for the lost, comfort for the saved, and conviction for the judgmental Pharisees. We all have experienced church services when the preached or taught word brought comfort to the believer and conviction to the sinner all at the same time. That just always amazes me about the word of God is how one verse can go out and yet it can be life and bread to people. And, and they can get something different from the same verse. And in my own life I have experienced um, you know, different years and seasons of my life where one verse has fit different years and seasons of my life because mm -hmm. the Word of God is living and breathing and it just, it changes. Um, I have always felt like, you know, you could look at a Bible with 3D glasses mm -hmm. and you could see different things, different aspects of it from different angles. Um, and that is the amazingness of God and His Word that He gave us, that it can convict the sinner and comfort the Christian. Well, this one story, we're actually, it's not even that long. It's, you know, what? Three two verses. Yeah, three verses. Mm -hmm. Yet, yeah, you can sit here and you can deconstruct it. And, you and we can, will. <laughs> yeah, and you can look at what's going on inside through cultural status, through relationship, mm -hmm. and through religious you know those three lenses and that's only the three off the top of my head but there are so many more down through the years that you can look at historical aspects you can take apart the gr grammatical structure yes and there are so many things going on when Jesus tells a story because he's wanting to get not only a broad base like you know every year we go through Easter and we tell the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Or, or the birth of Christ. Yeah. Uh, just what came we just through, that, one. through that Well, to us Christians, that means a whole lot different than to a sinner out in the world. Yes. You know, it does. they get presents or money or whatever. They focus on the pagan side of the holidays. And we look at who came to save us. Yes. And it's very, it's a drastic change when you come to Christ because we're completely. 180 away from the world. Yes, yes. The word is so powerful and often contains multiple layered messages in its passages without altering the clear truth represented in the printed verses. While the parables in this chapter are very clear, revelation of the love Jesus has for the lost, I am certain they also ministered to those standing in the crowd that day as his words reached out to the individuals present. The Word of God is amazing. It is inexhaustible. It is alive with the power of God. It speaks to us in so many ways. And here's that verse I was just quoting. For the Word that God speaks is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life and the spirit and of joints and of marrow exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes mm -hmm. of the heart. And that is Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Yeah. So in this first portion of, of this chapter in Luke, Jesus shared the parable of the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine the group that had assembled to hear Jesus. In my mind, I can see a group of shepherds standing near. These men clearly understood the importance of retrieving the sheep that had strayed from the, the safety of the fold. And here again is that song, um, Reckless Love, yep. straight from Scripture. They probably spoke to each other about the times they had been like that shepherd. Jesus spoke about 
Many times they had left their own flock to go out in the darkness and bring the one little lost and helpless lamb. Can you imagine the revelation they had as they saw the Lord as their shepherd, lovingly seeking for them to bring them out of danger? They understood what he was saying because they had experienced it. And now they could feel the compassion of the shepherd as they listened to him speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that I just want, I want to, you know, in my own world, where God spoke to me on a direct level, was when I had my own kids. You know, you, you have one understanding of, you know, God as your father. Um, but when you have children and, and you... you you hold that baby for the very first time and and the feelings just wash over you um there's a whole new level to your understanding of god and to everything that he wants to give you as his children yep and you know sometimes a spanking's the best thing for you <laughs> <laughs> you know but that's the same way with us discipline is a very large factor in growing up and mm -hmm. in raising a child correctly and when that child's in your arms when you first you know hold it you're not thinking about well they're going to tell me no they're going to disrespect me that all the stuff that has gone up to that point just sort of fades away and that's where you start from yes and and the thing about it is is as you watch a child grow and, and they go through the different ages and phases of life um, you even gain an understanding of what it means to grow in your Christian walk with the Lord. That, you know, you can't stay a baby on the milk um, your whole life. That you have to grow. You have to stretch your faith. Um, you have to step out in that faith. And, you know, you were talking about discipline. It's unpleasant, but it's necessary. Yeah. We don't like to discipline our kids, but it's necessary for them to understand and to learn from their mistakes. And I, I mean, I can remember as a kid when, you know, my dad would come sit on the bed and he was, you know, I had done something and he was going to spank me. And, and his words always seemed so lame. Um, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I was like, fat chance. You know? Well, let's turn around. I'll, I'll, I'll whoop you. you know. I'll be fine. I know. But as parents, you understand um, the difference that you know it is it's hard it's hard to to um, discipline your kids it's hard to dole out correction and you know and for me I think one of the hardest things is when your kid does it again mm -hmm. and and it, I've been there I've been that person that I know that I've made a mistake twice and I was like why didn't I learn the first time why didn't I do better the first time how am mm -hmm. I in this position again but God is so loving and he cares and he doesn't give up on us. No, and that's one of the big things. You know, I've heard God's a God of second chances. I'm like, well, they're more than just second. <laughs> but to God, it's always a second chance because he's, for, he's forgotten about the other one. He's taken that away and he's thrown it to the sea of forgetfulness. And we don't have to worry about him bringing up our past. The only yeah. two people that will bring up your past is you and Satan. That's right. I mean, that's about all there is to it. And I'm so thankful for that because there's a lot of stuff in my past that I don't want anybody else to know about now. <laughs> yep. want to be brought back up because I have moved on. I've grown since then. And that's one of the things when we come to Jesus, we don't have to be cleaned up. We don't have to be, you know, perfect because we're not. We're humans. That's right. And the only perfect person was crucified. Yes. And so we have to come to the conclusion that we're not here to clean up a person before we bring them to the altar. Yes. We're here to go out and get the filthiest person and drag them to the altar so they can get saved. Well, what's that? I think I heard it that, you know, we're fishers of men. We mm -hmm. catch them. God cleans them. Yep. You got to catch them before you clean them also. <laughs> but it's just one of those things. We can't be... Well, welcome. We're so glad that you're watching us from Uganda. That's very cool. Oh, that is great. <laughs> and, you know, but that's one of the main things. We can't be discriminatory. Mm -hmm. We have to go to the person that God sends us. Yes. And sometimes it's completely out of the way or it's not even a person we were thinking about. Yes. 
So in the third parable of this passage, Jesus shared the beloved story of the prodigal son, I, I, which I love, and the grief of the father. It was the same father's love that caused the son to return to his home. Quite possibly there was a father in the crowd who immediately pulled in closer to Jesus as he began this parable. I envision this man in the crowd who is experiencing the hurt of betrayal from his own son. Perhaps his beloved son was still away, enjoying his freedom while his father grieved, not knowing that dangers may befall him. As Jesus spoke, this dad became hopeful and was encouraged that his love, the strong love of a faithful father, would draw his wayward son home again. Yes, this man would have understood what Jesus meant. He felt the connection with the parable on a very real and personal level. Did the Heavenly Father grieve and desire fellowship with the man away the way he did for his lost son? Something about this parable made this dad want to run to his Heavenly Father. He wanted restoration with him, and his love for his son would draw him home. The way Jesus told the story gave his father hope, and his hope would end well also. Right in the middle of these parables, Jesus told us to consider the woman who lost a coin. Mm -hmm. I visualize a summer day. A woman was standing with hot sand under her feet, and a crowd was gathered. People were pressing in to hear the words of this man called Jesus that everyone was talking about. Some said that when he spoke, it was as if he looked right into your very soul, knew your thoughts, and heard your heart's cry. I don't know about you, but I've been into some some sermons where the preacher was preaching yeah, that way. We call it reading your mail. <laughs> yes. Many were comforted and drawn to him because of his insight, and others wanted to run away from him because of it. As this Jewish woman moved in closer, she understood what the others meant when they had spoken of this Jesus. She was drawn to his compassion and gentle love. His words of wisdom wrapped her heart in comfort, and she had heard testimonies of those who had been changed by him. Their brokenness had been mended and their hope restored. And while she hungered to be free from her own failures, she was also fearful he would see and expose her sins and struggles. But even more than her fear of exposure and shame, she desired acceptance and understanding, even forgiveness, from this teacher, prophet, man. She did not know what it was about him that made her want to be near him and understand his words and his teaching. What was the pull in her heart to him that made her lay down her fear of rejection and hopes he would speak to her heart and comfort her? She pressed in, hoping to see him, but not certain if she wanted to be seen by him. And then it happened. He looked directly at her. He looked into her very heart and said, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Her heart pounded. Did he know about her failures? Did he know that she had reason to have, have lost a coin? Did he know that she was troubled and considered breaking her covenant? And he continued, doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Was he trying to tell her that it would be all right? Was he trying to make her understand that she had lost and her relationship with her husband could be restored? Did, she want her, did he want her to realize that her situation really wasn't hopeless? Did he want her to stop and consider the value of her covenant and know that all that was lost really could be found? As if she was hearing her heart's cry, he added, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. He smiled at her and her heart was so moved by this unspoken revelation, he understood. He knew her warfare, he knew her struggles, but he had given her hope, hope that all that had been taken and lost would, could be, yes, would be restored. You know, as you were reading that, I was thinking, you know, it goes back to the one about closing the door. Yes, shut the door. And in that time, when you went inside and closed the door, you still had windows. So this supposed, or I would think, would be happening at night. And you know when we're when it's night sometimes we're desperate and 
one of the things about the silver coins is they shine. Yes. Well, when you go in and you light a lamp and you're sweeping around, even if that broom doesn't take all the dirt off that coin, if anything of that coin is exposed, you'll be able to see it. Mm -hmm. So there's still treasure inside the dirtiest yes. people. Yes. And there's still treasure no matter what we see on the outside. God still treasures that person. And, you know, the light of the world is Jesus. Yes. And as the night is around us, and sometimes it feels like there's nothing else, God can make those little treasures that he's put in us shine forth. Yes. And that'll bring us closer to him. And you know, it's just one of those things that God can move us closer to him, even though we think we're trying to pull away. Because no matter where we're at, if we stop, turn around and go back to him, he's so close you'll probably run into him as soon as you turn around. Well, um, one of the things, and if, if you haven't caught on already, restoration of what has been lost, that is what the study is about. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, sin is enticing. If it wasn't, people wouldn't be sinners. Mm -hmm. um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't tempt people so much, but it is enticing. And, you know... Um, but the thing is, and I remember growing up, my dad used to say, sin will take you further than you ever intended to go, and it'll keep you longer than you ever intended to stay, and it'll cost you more than you ever intended to pay. And the whole thing is, you know, when we are entertaining sin, it's, it's robbing us. Yep. It's taking things from us that we don't even sometimes recognize until it's too late that are gone. But... The, the blood of Jesus washes away our sins, and he is good to restore things that we have lost. Yep. Out here in West Texas, it's hard to keep things clean, especially after a dust storm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going out to a car, and we went and we got my vehicle washed the other day. Well, we had sort of a dust storm at night, and it just covered it up again. And, you know, that's sometimes how it feels with all the stuff going on in the world. It's hard to keep ourselves clean. Mm -hmm. But I am so thankful that we can go back and we can go before God and ask him to cleanse us again. And he will. It's never going to be a no. The grace and the mercy for us is always there. Yes. Um, and I think that's a good place to quit. I just, I don't, I don't see us topping that today. Um, you know, we have talked about restoration and we have talked about, you know, salvation today. And one of the things that we make it a point, um, if you ever listen to our, our Bible studies, is we always end um, by giving you an opportunity to know Christ. Um, I mean, that's, the it's, ultimate. It's the most important choice you'll ever make. Yes. And it's the only way to get into heaven because no sin yes. will enter into heaven. And when we put on what Christ did for us on the cross, yes. when that mercy and that grace comes upon you and fills you and cleans you out, you will be so much more than, you know, happy or joyful. It's an amazing feeling and it's an amazing thing that God has done for us and you know to completely commit to it I'm not saying you're not gonna have struggles because you are read you know in Acts where people started to get martyred for Christ but the reward in heaven for this little bit of discomfort right now is so much more than you could ever think possible you say the retirement plan as a Christian is out of this world yep <laughs> comparatively to the other ones yeah so um, I just want to give you an opportunity and maybe you've known the Lord um, you know maybe you're someone that you started watching us and everything we said you you knew it you already mm -hmm. you've already heard there heard that been there done that bought the t-shirt um, and we understand that we were both raised in church you know our parents were preaching to the choir at home all the time um, but that still didn't mean that I didn't make mistakes, that I didn't go out and, you know, try to prove my dad wrong. I did. And, but when I came back, I came back. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're sitting out there and it's a new year and um, you've realized that you're not with the Lord anymore and you need to be. 
Um, it's never too late. As long as you, you are breathing and there's life in your body, it is never too late to make a decision to um, serve the Lord, to repent. And it, to, repent just means to turn and go a different direction. Um, you know, as sinners, you're, you're heading toward hell. And when you decide that you are going to serve Christ, you turn and you go the direction of Christ and, and you're heading toward heaven. So, um, in, you know, there's something we've said already that God forgives us multiple times of the mm -hmm. same thing. But also God frees us yes. of things. We have to remember that we are not bound because Christ has freed us. Yes. Those things that are in our lives that have continuously, I mean, addictions, um, bondage, we can get away from those things by coming and believing yes. God can free us. And, you know, if you come to Christ and you pray the prayer and those things still raise their head, go find a honest and, you know, honorable pastor, one that preaches the word and, you know, counsel with him. And he can help you. And the Bible says that you will not be tempted where there will not be a way of escape. So if you're being tempted, look for the way out because there's a way out. Um, there is a different choice to be made. There, the choice is always up to the, to the person. Yeah. So anyway, if you fall into any of those categories, we want you to pray this prayer with me that I'm, I'm going to pray right now. And just repeat after me. Dear God, I know I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sin. That you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life. Help me to do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And it's just that simple. We believe in Jesus plus nothing. Um, if you said that prayer, you are a Christian. And if you said that prayer for the first time or for the 50th time, please let us know. We want to know um, that, that you are a new Christian. We want to welcome you into the body of Christ. And if you need prayer, go ahead and... For anything. Yeah, text us. Um, We'll have church tomorrow if you're in the Denver City area. We're going to start with Sunday school at 945, and then our regular service starts at 1045, and we have a new pastor. Um, the Lunsfords have retired, and now we have fresh meat. <laughs> <laughs> the Penners, and we are so excited that they will be here tomorrow for their very first Sunday. So come on by if you're in town, mm -hmm. and uh, you know we're praying that this new year is not going to be what 2020 was no. and we're praying it's a year of <laughs> restoration yep. from everything 2020 tried to take away 21 is going to be a year of restoration i really believe that you know anytime anybody starts talking about restoration i remember what david did after the enemy came and stole everything he had he recovered all and god told him to go after him and that's what i think we're supposed to do this year we're supposed to kneel down get into prayer and go after what has been taken. Yes. And I believe our peace and our joy and what God has promised us will be back shortly. Yes. You know, but I'm glad Satan can't take our peace and our joy. That's right. So God bless you. Um, if you need a Bible, you can Let also us contact us. Um, but until next time, which we don't exactly know uh, when that will be. We'll, we'll come at you soon. <laughs> We're um, gonna try it'll probably to, be next this week sometime. We'll probably we're gonna probably be getting a uh, schedule done sometime shortly. I hope so we can plan this out. But God bless you, and we'll talk to you next time.